Um, hello, welcome everybody. Welcome to Herding Bibliographic Cats, a mass cleanup of fixed field data. Um, my name is Amy Terlaga. I'm uh, hosting this session. I am from Bibliomation, the Connecticut Consortium. Um, Bibliomation is sponsoring this Zoom session. Um, closed captioning is being sponsored by Equinox Open Library Initiative. We'd like to thank our captioner. Um, this is, um, uh, the session is in meeting mode, not webinar mode. So please leave your video off and your mic off and please use chat when asking a question or, or commenting. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce Rogan Hamby from the Equinox Open Library Initiative, Sylvia Orner from the Scranton Public Library, and KD Greenleaf Martin from the Blair County Libraries. Uh, and without further ado, I will turn it over to them. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I hope everybody's enjoying the Zoom conference so far, the first of the Evergreen online conferences. Uh, we're gonna do some quick introductions of ourselves first, just for context. My name's Rogan Hamby. I spent a couple of decades in public libraries, uh, filling various roles, including just enough cataloging to claim I did it, um, but not a whole lot. These days I work doing migration and data work for Equinox, which if you're unfamiliar with, with us, we're a nonprofit uh, that support open source and libraries. Katie? I am Katie Greenleaf Martin, and I work with the uh, eight libraries in Blair County, Pennsylvania, as well as the other uh, five libraries in the Altoona Library District, which is Bedford and Huntington uh, counties. So I also have a background in cataloging, um, but primarily work now as an administrator, and so um, try to unite the, the worlds of public access and library administration and reporting with cataloging. Sylvia? And I'm Sylvia Orner. I'm the head of technical services here at the Scranton Public Library. That's that's all I do. So I'm pretty much your stereotypical like grumpy cataloger. <laughs> um, and Katie and I are both part of the Spark Consortium also, our libraries. Well, I have to say, I don't think Sylvia has been that grumpy in my experience, but, mm -mm. you know, <laughs> not, um, but, but we'll leave that. Maybe uh, she's grumpy when, you know, surrounded by books on her own or something. I don't know. So the first step is a trigger warning. Uh, if you've ever been traumatized by Mark, th this presentation is not going to help. Um, we're going to be talking about Mark a lot. So fair warning, if the burp Hurting bibliographic stuff wasn't enough of a warning. You're getting it right now. This is going to be talking about Mark. However, we are going to be abstracting it a fair bit. So if you're coming at this from more of a sysadmin or library administrative standpoint, I think there'll be a lot of content for you, but we're going to get some Mark concepts out of the way before we get into that meat. Um, and because it is called Herding Bibliographic Cats, we have a lot of cat pictures. They are all public domain and none of them happen to be mine because my cats refuse to stay still for pictures. Um, now, fixed fields. If you attended Galen Charlton's presentation yesterday on getting the most out of Mark, some of this is going to sound very familiar because we're gonna be talking about a lot of the same underlying concepts. Fixed fields are simply things in certain mark tags where the data is based on where the characters are in that tag rather than what the tag is. And these are gonna be things like the leader, the 007, the 008. Those are gonna be the three big ones. And their importance is that these are used by Evergreen to calculate things like what your search formats and your display icons are. So pretty important. So I kind of mentioned this already, what are fixed fields? They're where the information is based on the field. And I just wanted to give you an example here. If you pull up a random book in your Evergreen catalog and you go to the little display mark, um, you'll see one of the mark fields is the leader. And if you start counting at zero over to seven, that's all right, um, you'll probably see under the seventh position or eighth position, if you're counting from one, an M which stands for monograph. 
it was a serial, it'd be an S. And if it was a authority record, it would be a Z if I'm remembering correctly and so on and so forth. And this isn't the only thing that determines an item type, of course. There are also things called bib levels and uh, video recording levels, if it's a moving picture format and all kinds of other stuff. But we're not gonna get into that super nitty gritty detail. Uh, but just be aware that manipulation of this stuff is what determines it. And if you want a little bit more information about how Evergreen analyzes and makes use of that and how you can configure that, do go see Galen Charlton's presentation on getting the most out of Mark when we get them up on YouTube. So, so yeah. um, I was just going to say, take it over. <laughs> <laughs> we rehearsed, I promise. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the Pales Consortium, um, which we, we call Spark. Uh, as Sylvia mentioned, um, both of our library systems are part of that consortium here in Pennsylvania, along with um, uh, over 100, I think 140 some of our best library friends. And so we have about 1.75 million bibs, or we did at this point, which was almost a year ago now, right? So yeah. um, I, I don't know what it is now, but when we started this deduplication process, we had 1.75 million records approximately. And we had grown by 50% um, in five years, just to, to give really round numbers. And so when you look at the impacts of those migrations and other ILSs, many in, in Evergreen, we do get that item, um, you know, the little item format icons, the book or the CD audio book or the DVD, those come from the fixed fields as Rogan mentioned. And so that's not the case in all other ILSs. And it means that the data that was coming in was, uh, of varying quality, but there were also varying things that had mattered in the other ILSs. And so some things didn't get um, checked as well when they were being imported in the first place. And so that really um, impacted our users in terms of being able to see what types of items they were looking for and searching for and requesting. And we were concerned about this um, and the cataloging committee um, had many emails about it and, and trying to fix records one at a time just seems like it was not working for us. Um, and then also as we implemented a greater resource sharing, so my library and Sylvia's library are halfway across the state from each other, um, do not have a relationship except that we choose to share items with each other. And so if I'm trying to request an audiobook and it's on the same bib with other types of items, or it's not on a bib for an audiobook at all, then it makes it very difficult to, for patrons to make requests, for staff to make requests, and receive what they actually want to have coming to them. Um, and again, because we had also done some bibliographic deduplications um, in ongoing uh, projects, not only from our migrations, but also on a larger scale, um, that bad data was then causing items to be kind of shoved together um, into records that, that were then mixing item types and it, it became a problem definitely in terms of searching and placing holds. So we were looking for some help. Oh, and uh, again, the, the, the reasons for this have to do um, often with catalogers that are trained to um, attach uh, their holdings to whatever has the, the greatest number of existing holdings. And uh, especially if the format icon matches what they have in hand, they may not necessarily um, look at the rest of the data in the mark record, um, or they, you know, kind of quality varies in terms of, of skill of copy catalogers. Um, and then because we work dealing with a lot of migrations, they didn't always use these same mark attributes in terms of searching or in terms of identifying the types of records. And so the data that was coming in was very mixed as well. So we were looking for some help um, and Equinox, um, in, who had also handled our last big deduplication uh, project, which I believe Rogan and Sylvia and I were all on as well, um, was to look at what could be done uh, to really do a systematic cleanup 
of these incorrect fixed fields and to look at it from a holistic perspective and trying to, instead of trying to fix them one at a time. Um, and certainly to do some things in terms of training our catalogers and things like that, but to be able to get the database to a place where um, people could be confident in the information that they were seeing. Sylvia, I think, is going to so, talk about the plan that we came up with. I am. This is, this is part one. There's going to be a sequel later. Um, <laughs> so the general plan part one started with the analysis. We created the map of the CERC mods and also defined what we expected their search formats to equate to in Evergreen. Um, this was a little complicated because sometimes people were using CERC modifiers just to you know, fulfill their needs. Um, they knew that the book CERC modifier uh, would check out for two weeks. So they're like, I want this thing to check out for two weeks. So I'm just going to call it a book and that's okay. Um, so I, I know at one point we had one library, they were bringing in all their on order items as books. So it didn't matter if the record was for a talking book or if it was for a DVD. Um, they were calling it a book and that was creating some confusion. So we had to find a way to kind of um, narrow it down from there. So the gotcha with that is we had to kind of reverse the normal process. Normally you look to the MARC data, but because as we mentioned before, some of the MARC data was a little, um, what I like to call creative. Uh, it was not as, you know, the be all and end all that it could be. So along with the circulation modifier, we used other item level data like shelving location to get a better picture of the bibliographic items that we were holding. And so part two of the general plan, I told you there would be a sequel. And the sequel's even better than the original. <laughs> That's not true. Um, so part two, we just uh, generated like multiple uh, iterations for review. There were lots of lists, lots of like picking through things with a fine tooth comb. We really got to know our database and we learned some things and there were a lot of good things. So I don't want to, I don't want to say that it was all bad, but it's, it's very interesting to see uh, what comes from such a large shared catalog. So uh, we had a good chance to review that. And fortunately, uh, we're able to dodge summer reading so and make it happen. So this is the initial map of the CERC mods that we used and the search formats that we tied them to. We excluded some that were very obviously linked to maybe more than one item type. I think we excluded ILL, we excluded like government documents. I think we excluded Realia because a lot of times it was, you know, very uncertain what that happens to go with. Um, and then from there, we did our initial list supplemented by the shelving locations that I mentioned before. Um, and as I mentioned, we did assume that certain keywords were going to be indicative of the item types, like a, a book on CD or you know the DVD shelf. Um, unfortunately, we found out that was not always the case. Um, so we kind of had to go back to the drawing board a little there, but Rogan's going to get you, get us oh. into some of the math here in terms of what we figured out. Sorry, I was taking a minute to find my unmute button. <laughs> um, so as Sylvia said, we we dug and dug and dug through stuff, and we found a lot of surprises some very good ones, some very head scratching ones, some that frustrated us. <laughs> I don't think it's unfair to say. Um, but by the time all was said and done, 
what we had was out of 1.75 million records, 1.5 that matched and were good. They did not look like they would have any problems, uh, either because they were already correct or had completely consistent item level data to say, here is what the mark should be. But we still had about 250,000 that we needed to look at, which was too much for humans to just dig through. I, I don't want to speak for the catalogers of Spark, but I don't think it's unfair to say that they would be unhappy if they got a Excel sheet on their mailing list of 250,000 items and told to start churning <laughs> through it. Am I correct in that? I think that's probably accurate. I think yeah. that's, yeah. So of that, it was actually 228,000. I round a little bit. Um, we dug deeper, we did all the further comparison, and of those about 100,000, we had a high degree of confidence would match a single expected formats. And I should say of that, that means that we took that 100,000 and we did samples. We did spreadsheets, they were shared around, people looked at them. And once we started digging through those, we found a bunch of records that were identified with a URI volume. For those not familiar with that, that's an 856 subfield nine, where usually it's either a supplement to an existing record, or it may indicate something like a, um, an overdrive record or Access 360 or something like that. Those were interesting in their own right because some had copies attached while others did not. So what were those records? As we did all this, we had to make decisions. How far down the rabbit hole were we going to go with some questions? And sometimes we decided, you know what? There's only 50 of these. It's not worth the time. We're going to put them aside, and we're going to focus on the higher number of targets where we can make a greater impact on the catalog. And we found lots of discrepancies. Um, for example, differences in the descriptive mark data with those with URIs. So let's say we found an 856 subfield nine where it said this library should have restricted access to this link for overdrive. And by the way, the 300 fields say it's a book on CD. Not an electronic book, no RDA fields indicating otherwise, just this is a book on CD with an overdrive link. So value decisions had to be made about all this. And that's why we started pulling in at this stage information from the 300s, as well as in some cases, 500s, even 650s and 655s, uh, because we found that it was sometimes useful to highlight discrepancies or there were specific library systems that had encoded information in places like notes or 650s that were useful for identifying what the record was intended to represent versus what was actually specified in the record. Um, this was not a solution that came to a simple mathematical formula. Um, I'm forgetting the quote right now, but some mathematician once said the most complex problems are solved with the simplest formula. This was not an expression of that principle. <laughs> uh, there were some things that were very generalizable, but we had to code for a lot of exceptions that were specific to those various legacy ILSs that Katie talked about. You know, if in a certain legacy ILS, they did a certain thing with information in the 500s, but ignored the fixed fields, then we needed to identify those libraries and what that ILS had been and what they did and use that information. So there was a lot of per migration and per practices of member libraries that we had to account for specific to those. And Sylvia. An example, example of that uh, kind of uh, digging in <laughs> <laughs> from Sylvia. Oh, yeah, the multiple record formats. So we we found a number of records that were kind of like those combo records, like 
a DVD and a book, a CD and a book, a DVD and a Blu-ray. Um, they were relatively few in number, so we did decide to exclude these from the automated fix, but we did report on them. And one of the nice things I found was uh, items that came in like that, nine times out of 10, it was purposefully done. So all the more reason always, to exclude always them. always reassuring. Yeah. So, and I alluded to this before, the granularity challenge, not all shelving locations in Cirque modifiers were very granular, such as audiobooks or videos. Um, my library in particular was guilty of this. That's why I have to talk about this slide. Um, we used very general uh, shelving locations. So like everything is in stacks. Uh, so it was, it was very difficult. Like, is this supposed to be a book? Is this supposed to be a talking book? We are not sure at this point. We don't really have enough information. Fortunately, we were able to solicit uh, a good amount of community feedback and find out like, uh, how people were using their shelving locations, how people were using their circulation modifiers, and we were able to identify some very specific exceptions that we were able to either exclude or plan around. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't, I didn't get my wish of changing our shelving locations. That was, that was a hard no. <laughs> One day, Sylvia. My, someday. I'm, I'm not going to check the, uh, the log and see who else is on here from, <laughs> from <laughs> one account. Um, and another thing we had talked about early on was, was splitting records. So uh, Katie had mentioned them before. We had these records that, because of some poor fixed fields, had gotten multiple item formats jumbled together, and we thought wouldn't it be great if based on the circulation modifiers and shelving information, um, like we could separate these items are the audio books, these items are the regular books, but we decided that uh, that would just take too much time and that was that was tabled for a later date when we could devote more, more time to that and more individual attention. Yeah, and let me just say on that, uh, from a technical standpoint, that is definitely doable. And that's one of the reasons we originally talked about it as an objective of this. From my perspective, anyway, the reason that we ended up not doing it wasn't because it wasn't feasible, but because, um, and this is for the audience, not for Sylvia and Katie, of course, they lived through this with me. <laughs> um, the as we dug into it and we looked at the specifics of the records that we would want to potentially split apart and when i say split apart i mean say take this record that has both dvds and books on it and split it into two bibs one for the dvds and one for the books um which would then have a lot of inaccurate data in it say 300s on at least one of them but at least it would have the correct you know item type for holds and things like that uh but then as we dug into it there were so many circumstances where it wasn't clear because of things like circ mods being used for the circulation period rather than item description, that that would have even been the right thing to do. Um, so we might have been creating a bigger mess. So we kind of put that aside to focus on things that we knew would be improvements, which were turning out to have a lot of their own things to address individually. So. Anyway. Yeah. And I think, you know, one of the things we did, and I think we talked more about this later, it was to distribute those lists of bib numbers that were things that were still problematic so that, that when, you know, catalogers have five or 10 minutes, um, you could go, go check on a couple of them and, and see what you could, could figure out and fix. And I see just before moving on that Meg had a question in chat. Do you have any type of standardized naming in the shelving locations? Um, we do not for our consortium. It's, it's kind of left to each library and library system. Mm -hmm. So as, as you can I see that, that did create some difficulty in this particular project. And it's something that we do tend to suggest as part of migrations. Um, for, for libraries that, that I've, I've worked with, um, I, I certainly suggest that, that they come up with an internally consistent 
structure because one of the fun things about Pennsylvania libraries is that we are required, well, and maybe this is everybody because I think it's on the IMLS report, is that you have to um, report your children's circulations, your right. circulations yeah. on children's items. And so if you're um, shelving, if, in, in the case of my library system, because we revamped this when we migrated, those um, age categories are alphabetical in the shelving locations. So if you were just in, in uh, Chris's session where he was going through and selecting the shelving locations, it's very easy to select that chunk. Um, but that was because I that was an intentional decision that was made as part of the migration um, because the people doing the migration understood the reporting requirements. And um, that sort of requires a lot of conditions to be met. Um, and that, so we don't, we don't have a consortium wide structure, um, but with new migrations, we do try to encourage. Was there anything else in the chat? I can't, I, I don't think I can see it while I'm presenting. Uh, Meg I, was sharing that uh, they have some consistency in terminology, but the names themselves aren't identical. And she wonders if it would help in the keyword search process. Um, not really. <laughs> I, I think consistency is good and it can make your life easier in a lot of ways, especially in reports. Um, but, and I think the IMLS example of for audiences is probably the single best example possible there, which Katie brought up, uh, because audience is so rarely coded in the MARC record. And if you get 10 people together to, uh, and ask them how they use the different designators for audience in a MARC, even if they do use it, after an hour of debate, you'll have at least 15 different opinions. <laughs> mm -hmm. So. Yeah, just my opinion. And then um, one of the things that we also did, uh, which has been very helpful, and I, I think, um, you know, I, I, I think this is probably something that um, Equinox has, has probably started doing intentionally on its consulting projects, is to add some notes so that we can later see what um, records were modified in this project. And so you'll, you'll go, you'll be looking for, at something and you'll say, oh, you know, this was, uh, I think it's the notice something like modified in, you know, 2019 by the fixed fields project. Um, and mm -hmm. so you can, you can not only, if you wanted to get a dump of all the records that were modified, um, but on an individual level, um, when you're either trying to um, sort out a mystery, uh, you can see whether or not it was, was modified in that project. Uh, or if you're um, going forward, if we do another win, we do another deduplication, uh, <laughs> because deduplications are never over, uh, then we'll be able to um, do something like giving those records that we did look at in this project a higher score, uh, or I don't think we would, but you could give them a lower score um, in considering uh, the, va the value added of that record. So that's been really nice uh, as an addition uh, to the database to have that information on the individual record level. Another nice thing I, I did want to add about the, the audit trail was that they were able to, for things like DVDs that had a 007 field uh, in the event it was changed, the old 007 field was inserted in a 900 field below it. So if you ever wanted to, you know, revert, that information was there. Yep. Nice. And any modified zeros or eights were uh, stored as well. Respectively, the sevens went to a 917 and eights to a 918. Um, there were some things that we just didn't even try. Um, we, we talked a little bit about this earlier. Um, the, the Braille item type had more, uh, search format type has more to do with just the sheer number. There's not a, a ton of volume there, um, and it's kind of a specialized record type. So we did that, el eliminate that from our searches. We figured things that say they're Braille are probably Braille, and we will let them continue to be. Um, we also, in looking at our circulation modifiers, um, uh, we did not look at GovDocs. 
Um, we don't have a ton of them in, in pails and again, very specialized item type. Um, ILL uh, circ mod items are typically for um, brief records in our, we have a couple of library systems that do use a, a brief record workflow for doing their interlibrary loans. And so they come, they go, uh, not, it, not really important, I guess you could say, whether or not it, it has the right uh, fixed field information. Um, media, uh, we didn't look at, and I don't know, do you remember why we didn't look at media, Sylvia? We, we actually did initially. Um, some of these we ruled out early on in the process. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, ILL, GovDocs, and unknown because of their very natures. Media originally was one we looked at, and it is not used by all the library systems, and it became a tar pit. Yes. Um. <laughs> I, I think people were using it for many and varied things. For many, many different and, things, yes. And so and, uh, to try to sort that out in terms of, of the fixed fields was not going to be a productive use of our time. Uh, and again, not a ton of, um, you know, looking at our overall record database of 1.75 million records, not a ton of them in that particular category. Realia similarly um, represents uh, just in my library system, everything from ukuleles to paintings to, um, I think we have some saddles somewhere um, that are cataloged. And so uh, being able to, to suss that out, um, we also have um, some libraries that, that use um, intermix realia and equipment and so oh and if anybody is not a cataloger realia just means stuff yeah it's the it's the everything else category and it just sounds better than saying stuff and so that's what catalogers say non -media yes i did stuff. say saddles there <laughs> are saddles in the blair county library system and, and now uh, i want to look up your saddle records you and see how detailed they are <laughs> you can't, I'm not 100% I'm not sure the saddles are uh, cataloged, so I'd, ha you know, I'd have to fact check myself on that one. Um, and uh, so, but there's, there's just a, a lot of variation there. I, I know we use um, the Realia Circ Mod for some of our um, things that could, could fit under, under equipment. Um, and so there's a lot of kind of intermixing of categories there. And so, and obviously, if an item doesn't have a Circ Mod, then that's a separate problem that we decided not to address. Real <laughs> Barb, Barb, I know that Barb's library system also has ukuleles. So um, <laughs> that, that's a, a, a central Pennsylvania thing that we circulate ukuleles. So uh, those were, were some of the things that we just kind of banned from our process there, deeming it uh, not worth it to, to spend the time. But one of the things that we, oops, Sorry. One of the things that we did that was cool, and we didn't do it first, um, uh, Bibliomation and GA Pines had developed a new um, item type uh, that is called preloaded audio. And so um, the brand name for these things, I think, uh, is Playaways. They're not the only one, but they seem to be the most popular. They're the, yeah. So these are the um, audio books, typically, although I think they can be other types of audio, uh, like recordings and, and performances. And they are loaded on a digital format and you actually check out the, the player. And sometimes they check out with headphones and sometimes you supply your own headphones. Um, but lots of people were doing them as CD audio book, which is not accurate, um, but there it's, to use the equipment circulation modifier also doesn't really help, especially in terms of holds and in terms of searching. Um, and so uh, this was a, a wish list bug on, on Launchpad that some people worked on and uh, it's got a cool little icon and everything. And so we were able to, um, using some, some various uh, scripting wizardry by Rogan, uh, identify these playaway type items that were in our consortium and go ahead and give them that new format, which we like very much. And Rogan, I'm going to throw it back to you for some okay. math. So in the end, out of the roughly 1.75 million records, 
we ended up modifying 186,772, which is approximately 10.2% of the collection. And that doesn't sound overwhelming. You know, 10%, I mean, it seems like a lot of work for 10%. 10% of one and three quarter million records. And that's a pretty impact, pretty big impact on holds and searching. When you're changing 10% of your collection, that's a huge public service impact. And I think it's been pretty successful. I'm not gonna claim perfect. When you're, when you're dealing with hundreds of thousands of records being modified, perfect isn't your goal. Perfect is the enemy of progress, but I think think it was overall very successful. Uh, Sylvia, Katie, your opinions. Oh, absolutely. And I, I think one of the big things that was my goal for the project are were things that did not have fixed field data got that data. And yeah. so, I mean, to me, it was a win. Yeah. yeah, we had some very brief, rec short, very brief records in the system, and this is common of large consortia that didn't have any identifiable fo search format. So, yeah, that was very nice yeah. to do. Yeah, um, and I think, you know, especially for those of us that are resource sharing um, with other library systems, so like with my library system, I know how they use CERC mods, and I can look at something and kind of tell you what it is. Um, but as I'm, you know, we have these... Um, relationships that with counties that we don't have any other relationships with. So I don't know how they use shelving locations in northern Cambria or in North Pocono and mm -hmm. um, having greater confidence in the data that I'm seeing and also only very rarely not seeing a search format icon at all um, helps me feel more confident and I think it helps more holds get placed and filled um, where people are actually getting what they want to get. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then the follow-up question that people sometimes ask, well, is this something I can use? And such as it is, absolutely. The such as it is caveat is there is such a thing as the GNU public license. Uh, Equinox makes the code that we wrote up for this available to people through our migration tools repo. It is available if you search the web or I have it right here on the slide. Uh, you can clone it, you can use the tools, no warranty express or implied. Uh, the tools are under a subdirectory for SQL base 21 fixed fields.sql um, and includes all the tools we use to do this. Not the actual scripts, but the functions I wrote the data definition tables and all that. And if you use them and you want to do any enhancements, feel free to send me patches. <laughs> um, yeah. But overall, I would absolutely say that it was a success. I think uh, that much like deduplications, it, um, will be something that we'll want to do again at some point mm -hmm. um, and and do uh, either slightly differently or, or just with new stuff that, that's come in because it is a, a very much an iterative process. But uh, we, I think um, that everybody who worked on it felt like that it was time well spent. Yeah, and I, to let people know, we had a timeline involved and there was a end of project timeline that wasn't very flexible due to funding cycles and other things. Uh, and I think that if we do another round of this, it would allow us to pick up on some of those things like say the media uh, circ mod that we simply couldn't prioritize the first time around. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think we were also dealing with um, just, just a lot of Sylvia was saying of missing data and that it in additional iterations we would we wouldn't be starting from zero yeah how long did i feel like we we had a hole in this project for summer reading and so it might have taken close to six months am i over remembering that no it wasn't six months um okay it might have been more like, like six weeks <laughs> <laughs> <It> might, <laughs> yeah 
I, I feel maybe like it most was. Of it, maybe we stuck it in after yeah. summer reading and before the end of the federal fiscal year. I don't think it was because of the end of the federal fiscal year. I think there was some sort of reporting for funds spent uh, that didn't align with the fiscal year that it had to hit. Okay. Okay. Um, but yeah, we hit. We had some period of discussion before it started, but once it started, we kind of hit the ground running, and um, we both had a. We there was a functional limit because there were only so many hours we could allocate to it, man hours. Uh, so there were things that we had to prioritize. So we went for the low hanging fruit and the things we could get the most bang for our buck on. So I could go back and look uh, if you are interested, but my memory is somewhere like six to eight weeks. What do you think, Sylvia? Okay. That's, that's about what I was thinking because I want to think that we were done by the beginning of October. Yeah. Okay. I may be remembering inception of pro project idea to completion. Well, as six months. we had discussion. Our second big wave of deduplication finished uh, the previous year, really. And we started talking about this immediately in the follow up to that deduplication because you know, there were issues found with the deduplication where the deduplication worked correctly, but records merged because of bad fixed fields. And so in the analysis of the deduplication, we immediately started talking about, well, what can be done to handle this problem? So we kind of had discussions about it for quite a while before we formally started the project itself. And the discussions were kind of vague and all that, but they did, inf they, they did make sure that we were all on the same page and able to hit the ground running once it actually started. Mm -hmm. And uh, Lene is also asking about, you know, how much time did we work on it? I, I'm, I'm sure Rogan had days where he worked on it several hours a day. Um, and those of us who were testing definitely put some decent chunks of time in. Um, but I, I, don't, I don't remember putting several hours a day into it. Um, you know, a couple hours couple times a week in the in the heavy testing phases I think yeah um, for me my time came in spurts because mm -hmm. the kind of work I was doing uh, involved a lot of scripting which is kind of high focus stuff that if you put down and pick back up it takes a long time to reorient yourself so I would in fact tend to work on it like six hours in a day but then I might not look at it again until the next week Other questions? I'm, I'm going to scroll up and see if I missed anything. Blazing sense. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and Meg is saying so much legacy weirdness and fixed fields. Um, yeah, consortia that have grown through migrations. Uh, I think it was Katie that mentioned early in the presentation that not all, all, not all ILSs care about the fixed field data that can create very interesting situations and migrations, and those can stick around for many years. Um, I won't name names, but I myself have been an administrator for an ILS that never looked at them, and after we migrated to Evergreen, we had, we had work ahead of us. <laughs> well, and I have to say that I was surprised because the library, the, bi the big library in my system is an OCLC library, and they had a number of things that had just no 007. And I'm thinking that, that there was the only holding was at that library. So the assumption then is that they brought that in from World Connect. Yep. And um, it didn't matter because our previous, uh, like now somebody would notice, but in our previous ILS, which may or may not share the name of a Game of Thrones character, um, <laughs> it wasn't used for anything. And, and so it just, it didn't, you know, rise to the top of the pile. Yeah. Uh, there's several kind of, people. I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. I was going to say what you were going to say. There's a couple more questions. Yeah. Uh, several questions on the theme of migrations. And is there anything you can do to make migrations better with this in mind? Um, well, here at Equinox, one of the things we do on our migrations 
is that in fact, we use this tool set that we built uh, for this project and we do map incoming items conservatively and move their fixed fields where we can to make them work during a migration. So, you know, if items are incoming and the consortia they're migrating into uses, say, book to represent a print monograph, and all the items are attached to a record, and the record does not have any fixed fields that translate to anything in Evergreen, when we're migrating that record, we will make it a print monograph bib record. So, so we do attempt to mitigate against that in migrations. Um, and so can others. <laughs> As for the broader question of, do I have suggestions about how to make migrations easier? Yes, but we don't have enough time for that in the whole rest of this day. <laughs> uh, and for yeah, those who don't know do, me. We could do a whole thing on that next year. We could do, we could do a pre-conference yeah. on R Rogan pontificates about <laughs> migrations. Yeah, migrations. And you know what? I would go to that. <laughs> <laughs> um. Um, and yeah, I mean, to, to Chrissy's point, some of this definitely had to do with um, original cataloging. Um, and by original, I mean like cataloged with originality uh, and not necessarily with uh, adherence to AACR2 or RDA standards. Um, so there, there's definitely some of that. I mean, you, you got a uh, mixed multitude of things going on in, in, in a database like ours. So um, there's, there's lots of culprits, um, but especially in the case of a missing, um, you know, z missing 008 or 007 data, the, the fix is all pretty much the same, which is to figure out what it is and stick the right characters in there. So we didn't we didn't deal too much as much as we complain about the migrations and the other ILSs in the process we didn't really talk about why things were the way that they were because it didn't really impact what we were going to do about it yeah and and to be fair fair the fixed fields issue is sometimes in a group difficult to discuss because it is a very cataloger centric thing um, and if you have other staff involved in a migration who don't have any cataloging background, you really have to prepare yourselves to discuss it in a way that's non-cataloger friendly. Or it just ends up being sort of a source of noise that the reference librarians, the children's librarians, whoever, just doesn't want to deal with amongst everything else that has to be dealt with in a migration. Absolutely. And for those attending who don't know me, that's what I, I spend a lot of my time doing migrations. So that's why I can pontificate. <laughs> you have definitely earned that right. I think that's appropriate. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think to make to both Rogan's point and Meg's point that, and this is something Sylvia and I certainly talk about a lot, is that cataloging is access. Right, like we're not, not that we don't get kind of, you know, uptight about certain things, um, but the reason that we do it is it impacts the patron experience and it impacts discoverability. And so um, that's, it's, it is, maybe it is a nitpicky detail, but it, that doesn't mean that it doesn't matter. We're nitpicky uh, for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a question from Jeremiah uh, about a live demo of editing with one of those tools. I assume you mean the SQL code. Uh, I'll tell you what, this isn't the right audience for that, I think, but I'm doing a presentation tomorrow on Perl uh, PL, uh, which is using Perl code inside Postgres functions. So I will be glad to demo it tomorrow during that, if you wish. And that definitely will be the right audience for it. <laughs> uh, 
And okay, let's see. Sarah, if you're used to an ILS that doesn't make use of the fixed fields, may not be used to worrying about them or paying much attention to them. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, any uh, anybody that's ever cataloged for any significant amount of time knows that sometimes you just got to get the materials moved through your office. That's just the reality. So I'm not blaming the catalogers for it. It's just a reality that when you move to a system that does use fixed fields, and Evergreen is not alone in this by any stretch of the imagination. Um, it's just that there's no such, there's an old joke in the computer world. The great thing about standards is that there are so many to pick from. And <laughs> that's certainly true of how fixed fields are used by ILSs. And yes, you have to catalog for the system you've got. I absolutely agree with that. And that's the, that's the cats that we're hurting, absolutely. Yep. Oh no, and in the transcription oh, no. it says that's the cats that we are owned. Oh. Hopefully they go. We, we will fix that in the transcript file. <laughs> Her, herding, herding cats. <laughs> there we go. Okay. I'm sorry. Apologies to our transcription people who are doing a wonderful job and it is fantastic to have uh, transcription services. Um, yes. And I think that will, these uh, posted on YouTube with the closed captioning will be a wonderful resource for a really long time. And so I appreciate um, Equinox sponsoring that as well as Bibliomation sponsoring our session today. And uh, <laughs> let's see, Mary says, Mary from Bibliomation says, on a smaller level, we have our libraries report when a record doesn't have an icon or appear in a format based search when it should. We do centralized cataloging and stuff can slip past us. Yeah, uh, if, if you ever figure out how to have perfection from human effort, Mary, let me know. Um, <laughs> I don't think it'll happen in my lifetime. <laughs> um, but I do think you're lucky to have some centralized cataloging. That's a resource that uh, very few consortia get to have. Um, and I'm not going to call it a luxury because I know the consortia that have that have, you know, uh, worked hard to make that resource available and make it possible, but I know it's a something that a lot of consortia wish they could do and just for a variety of reasons aren't able to. And the list of reasons why not is very long. We don't need to get into that. Uh, vendor records. Um, I don't think I should discuss vendor records in a public forum. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just say the quality varies dramatically vendor to vendor. I'll just leave it there. <laughs> yes. Hey, thank you very much. This was very informative. And uh, I want to thank our three presenters. You, you worked well together, I have to say. 